Welcome everyone to this third topical session in the US-Japan Council's virtual 2020 Public Symposium titled Philanthropic, Philanth Philanthropy Leadership, Historical Reconciliation and Today's Landscape. I'm Leona Hiraoka, Senior Advisor for Snyder Strategies and a member of USJC's Board of Directors. First, to cover some logistics, this session will be conducted in English but Japanese interpretation is available by clicking on the globe icon at the bottom of your screen. We also want to take this opportunity to thank our many sponsors and promotional partners for your support of the US Japan Council and this symposium. I would like to offer our sincere appreciation to our platinum sponsor Fabit and to our other platinum sponsor, the Ford Foundation. I would also like to thank our title sponsors Central Pacific Bank Foundation, Hitachi, Itoen, Mitsui, MUFG Union Bank, the Terasaki Nibe Foundation, and Toyota Research Institute. I would also like to thank our signature sponsors, which you can see displayed on this slide. We are so grateful for your support in helping to make programming like this possible. And to the many companies and individuals who make up our premier sponsors, we truly appreciate your generosity. We're proud of this fantastic group of sponsors and supporters and couldn't be here without you. Finally, our gold sponsors can be seen on this slide and we would like to thank you once again, each and every one of you for your continued support, especially through this most challenging year. I would also like to thank our promotional partners for this session whose logos can be seen on this screen. Having spent years in the nonprofit and national association world, I fully realized the importance of philanthropy as a driver for social change. Today's esteemed panel will offer their insights on the historical impact of philanthropy and the central role it plays today. So now I'd like to turn it over to our moderator, David James. David is senior advisor to the president for institutional development at the Okinawa Institute of Science and Technology Graduate University and Managing Director at the Okinawa Institute of Science and Technology Foundation. He is also a USJC council member who serves on the Program Development Committee. He has many years of foundation and philanthropic experience and serves in governance and leadership roles at numerous US Japan institutions and organizations, including International Christian University, International House of Japan, the John Manjido Whitfield Center for International Exchange, and many more. He and our guest speakers today will discuss the historical role of public and private funders in strengthening US-Japan ties through creating philanthropic institutions and the global and social trends that are directing foundational giving and nonprofit missions today. And with that, I give you David James. Well, thank you so much for that very kind introduction, Leona. And I would also like to express my deep appreciation to the US Japan Council for hosting this event as part of the 2020 Public Symposium. The role of philanthropy in US Japan relations is often overlooked. For instance, in the post war period, philanthropy, philanthropy played a significant role in building understanding and reconciliation between the US and Japan. One example of this, which you will soon hear about, is the role that philanthropy played in forming the International House of Japan. And another very interesting example is the formation of International Christian University, or ICU, in Tokyo, which began with significant donations from individuals in the United States, but also, importantly, donations from Japanese people. In the Hachiro Yuasa Museum, on ICU's campus, you can actually find a large card catalog listing countless donations from Japanese individuals to help form that university at a time just after World War II when people had few extra resources. But philanthropy also paid for scholarships, for the development of American studies programs in Japan and more. 
And the Japan Center for International Exchange, JCIE, conducted a conference on this topic and compiled an amazing book on the subject in 2006, which I wanted to point out to the audience, titled Philanthropy and Reconciliation, Rebuilding Post-War U.S.-Japan Relations. I encourage all of you interested in this topic to take a peek at that amazing text. Philanthropy continues to impact U.S.-Japan relations, and the U.S. and Japan have many ways in which they can work together to direct philanthropy to impact global challenges. To explore this, we have an amazing panel with us today, and I want to express my deep appreciation to them for sharing their time and expertise with all of us. I also want to mention that I hope the audience will engage with us and ask questions. We, we very much welcome that, and you can use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your Zoom screen to ask questions. We do have some time dedicated to it, but feel free to ask questions throughout, and if it uh, weaves in well, we'll try to raise those questions. I'd now like to introduce the panelists. Kosei Kobayashi, Amir Pasek, and Katsuji Imata. I'll begin with Kosei Kobayashi. Kosei is Deputy Managing Director and General Manager of Membership at the International House of Japan, joining us from Tokyo. He's also the President and CEO of KK Holdings, a consulting and M&A advisory company. And he's been Senior Advisor of several companies, including a Japanese auction house and investment advisory company based in Hong Kong. He served as president and chairman of the NYU Club in Japan from 2017 to 2019, and he's now a member of the club's Asian Committee, and he's a founding member of the Asia Society Japan Center. Thank you for being with us. We also have Dr. Amir Pasek with us. He is the Eugene <coughs> R. Temple Dean of the Indiana University Lilly Family School of Philanthropy, which is the world's first school devoted to research and teaching about philanthropy. Prior to joining, Pasek was Vice President of International Operations at CASE, which is the Council for Advancement and Support of Education. I think many of you likely know it, but it's a global professional association serving educational institutions and advancement professionals. He also served as Deputy Director of the World Security Project at Rockefeller Brothers Fund and was Deputy Vice President for Advancement at George Washington University. Amir, thank you for being with us as well. And last but not least, I'd like to introduce Katsuji Imata, who is President of Social Impact Management Initiative Japan, CIMI, co-CEO of Blue Marble Japan and Managing Director of the CSO Network Japan. He has over 25 years of nonprofit NGO senior management experience in the US, Japan, and South Africa with a focus on strengthening civil society. He's been back in Tokyo since 2013, where his central work has been promoting the role of evaluation and impact management in social and corporate sectors. And he serves as a member of the Social Impact Measurement Working Group of the GSG for Impact Investment at the Japan National Advisory Board, as well as an evaluation advisor to the Japan Network for Public Interest Activities, which is a government assigned body to manage and fund the dormant account assets for social purposes. Beyond these primary roles, he also serves on the board of Japan Civil Society Network on SDGs, SDGs Japan, the Japan NPO Center, and Japan Evaluation Society. So without further ado, I would like to turn it over now to Kosei Kobayashi, who is going to tell us a little bit about the International House of Japan as a case study in how philanthropy played a very significant role post-World War II in bringing the US and Japan together and helping Japan connect with other countries as well. As well. Kosei. Okay. Thank you very much for the David and the uh, kind introduction. And good morning and good afternoon, good evening for everybody. Uh, thank you and very much for the inviting me uh, this uh, USJ Council annual conference today. As you may know, uh, the, uh, according to the, uh, my background, uh, I'm just doing the uh, banking business and the uh, uh, publisher of fashion magazine and m and consulting. It's a little bit far from the you know, philanthropy world. But uh, fortunately, uh, this year, I just appointed as the director of the International House of Japan as a development and uh, membership uh, uh, division. 
and the, I'm very happy to the, uh, you know, uh, uh, finally join the uh, uh, philanthropy <coughs> world uh, again, again now. So uh, I'm very happy, and I uh, try to do the uh, explain the uh, what is the International House of Japan and the historically. Uh, let me just start of the uh, presentation of I House Japan right now. Okay, and the back to the uh, uh, I House Japan's history, we have to point it out two very important gentlemen and leaders, philanthropy kind of gentlemen. One is the uh, uh, US side, uh, John D. Rockefeller. We can call the uh, John. This picture is right side gentleman. And the one is the uh, uh, Shigeharu Matsumoto. Oh, let me, let me just talk to the uh, John. Uh, John, as you know, the uh, John is uh, one of the uh, wealthy family member, and he knows very well about you know, uh, Japanese or Asian culture and the traditional uh, from the uh, young folk because of, he had uh, studied in the, uh, abroad. And also the uh, Shigeharu Matsumoto, uh, left-hand side gentleman, is the, also the, the you know, uh, one of the uh, wealthy in the, you know, heritage uh, families member and he studied in the US after graduation of the uh, Tokyo University and the uh, study at the uh, Yale University uh, uh, and he became the uh, famous journalist after coming back from the US to Japan and actually this is two, these two readers uh, set up the uh, I House Japan uh, factory uh, and I think this is a symbolic you know, uh, members for the uh, establishment of the IHJ. Okay, let me explain how these two uh, leaders uh, established IHJ, International House of Japan. Uh, next, please. <clears throat> Before the World War II, uh, the conference, like today's conference, of the I, uh, Inter Institute for the Pacific Relations was held in Kyoto, 1922. 29. It's a quite almost uh, 19 years ago. There, John and Shige first met. Uh, John visited Japan as an assistant of the secretary, secretary and Shige attended the conference as a secretary to Japan delegate. At that time, John was 23 years old and Shige uh, is 30 years old. It's very, very young uh, uh, gentleman. So they develop mutual affection almost immediately and relationship between US and Japan, but uh, it's becoming worse and worse as you know. Uh, these two countries at the time after the, uh, uh, you know, uh, this conference, so uh, got, got, got into the uh, tragic wartime until 1945. I don't know how these two friends uh, because, you know, uh, keep the uh, good relationship. Uh, at that time, there's no cell phone, iPhone, uh, communication tool, it's limited. But these two uh, gentlemen becoming the, uh, you know, deep in the uh, friendship, uh, do, even during the war. And after World War II, at the beginning of the 1951, John uh, came to Japan as a member of the uh, dedication headed by John Foster Dallas who was assigned uh, by President Truman to negotiate the pre provision of the peace treaty with Japan. And John had been invited by Dallas to jo uh, join the mission with the responsibility for developing policy recommendations for uh, the cultural, educational, and informational aspect of post-treaty US-Japan relations. During his stay in Japan, John reunited with Shige after a long interval across to the 20 years. Together, they found I House in 1952 to promote mutual international understanding through cultural exchange and intellectual cooperation between Japanese nationals, Japanese nationals, and the various foreign peoples, especially, especially US citizens. So Japan uh, finally joined World Community of Shari, end of this year. Next, please. And next challenge is fundraising, actually. Uh, after World War II, this is very, very difficult time for the uh, uh, Japan itself. And in order to build house practically, 
uh, we need over 200 million Japanese yen. That amount is equivalent, three trillion yen uh, equal uh, present value actually. And the, the amount was very huge. And thanks to the Rockefeller Foundation, uh, they committed half of the amount. But Japanese side also have to raise the fund up to half, other half. Uh, that means 100 million Japanese yen. It's at that time, a uh, prime minister salary, annual salary is 1 million yen. So the amount is 100 times of the uh, prime minister's salary. So very, very huge. Uh, and back, because of Shige's big effort, uh, the Prime Minister uh, Yoshida, Shigeru, Shigeru Yoshida, held a kickoff party uh, for domestic funding campaign at his official residence. Actually, this is just today, 68 years ago, November 19th, Japan time. So uh, 68 years ago, this is a right-hand side picture. Uh, oh, they have the uh, kickoff party for fundraise. At that time, Mr. Aisuke Kabayama, uh, he is the uh, first chairman of the I House, had the, made a historical speech to raise, fund, raise funds. And the, it's very difficult, but securing such a huge amount was a great challenge, but the uh, goal was successfully met just only one year, thanks to the contribution for many co corporate and individuals in Japan side, including Prime Minister Yoshida also, and also a Nobel Prize novelist, Yasunari Kawabata, and other so many, you know, uh, corporate and the uh, people and individual uh, acquaintances of the uh, Shige Matsumoto. A total is 1,500 people and the corporates. So we did, they did uh, the fund rates uh, at that time, just one year. Next piece. And the, so next step is how to build a high house, high house practically. So who gonna be a designer? So at that time, uh, the committee in, in this will drive, decide one major uh, architect, but among these three, Legend and the but they decided to all of three uh, collaborate with or design of the Ein House. So Maikawa uh, Yoshimura Asakakura. So I can say this is kind of the uh, three big opera tenor Domingo Pavarotti Carreras at, at the time. Such kind of a very dream team. So we decided uh, to, to three a collaboration act. Next, please. And next, next, see, And finally, in 1955, just only the after three years after the fundraise party, uh, International House of Japan was building, was built completely. The mission of the Iron House at that time, uh, maybe just present time, is be a catalyst creating the space and opportunity for dialogues through cultural exchange and intellectual cooperation and for network building uh, among the people of Japan and the other countries so that the citizens of the globe can achieve a deeper mutual understanding to open the way to living and coexisting in harmony for a global peace. Next piece. Only 10 years after the World War II, US and Japan build beautiful space and building to make dialogues through culture exchange and the intellectual cooperation for network building. So this is the Matsumoto of uh, the uh, opening ceremony speech. He mentioned uh, the people of the world, despite their differences, can contribute to world peace as well as the quest for truth through interaction and cooperation with the humanity and this respect for other cultures. Such sentiment is all the more crucial in this time of difficulty. So we have the uh, show video, just one minute video news, reporting for the uh, uh, ceremony of the opening ceremony I have Japan almost in, in 68 
65 years ago. Could you start? The dedication of the International House of Japan in Tokyo opens a new era of cultural exchange with foreign countries. Dignitaries from many nations attend the ceremonies at which American Ambassador Allison speaks. In the audience are John D. Rockefeller IV and former Japanese Premier Yoshida. Speaking on behalf of the project's foreign supporters, John D. Rockefeller III hails the completion of the important international center. The $500,000 structure is open for inspection by the visitors. In addition to a library, the center has a lecture hall, dining room, and boarding facilities for foreign students, a gateway to a better understanding between the peoples of the West and East. One of John and Shige's first goals was to encourage prominent intellectuals to visit Japan. The International House invited a number of renowned scholars and dignitaries. They included former First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt, diplomat and leading authority on the Cold War, George Kennan, and father of the atomic bomb, Robert Oppenheimer. It's, it's indispensable role in helping post-war Japan regain its place in the international community after the opening. We welcome uh, the Roosevelt, Mrs. Roosevelt and the Oppenheimer, Joe F. Kennan, and the Paul Saul Birrow, and the uh, Robert Reich, uh, Edwin Reichauer, and the Isam Noguchi, or oh, such, uh, you know, uh, uh, great people, uh, especially academic and the cultural top tier people from the US so far. There is a renewed sense that a deep understanding of the United US is crucial, critical, and this will remain our focus. In our vision, we have committed to strengthening the network in the in the Pacific for peace and uh, coexisting in the region just recently. But uh, our historically US and Japan, US uh, relationship very important. I have pride itself in helping shape a better future, not simply uh, restoring on its past glories. I house has been kept the place as a civil society keep keeping distance from the uh, one government or uh, government or one you know ideology and even region re regional um, so to speak we are not you know or we are not track one we are track two place to have the free discussion and exchange opinion freely okay so next please this is a view from the uh, my office uh, this is a color, the uh, leaf, and the, uh, this is a garden. And the garden designed in 1929, coincidentally, this is the first met John Sige here, uh, by the seventh generation of the fam famed Kyoto landscape artist, Ogawa Jihei-san, uh, for Iwasaki Koyata-san. Uh, Iwasaki is the uh, Mitsubishi a group, uh, first generation head of Mitsubishi called Conglomerate and retained its design and change from those days. And it has continued to charm people since the pre-war period. And the next is a building, please. Since its completion, uh, soon after World War II, uh, still our building is a very strong religion, resilient. And uh, we will have the, uh, uh, lots of the uh, guests to here. And the, uh, as I mentioned, this is a three very famous legend architect, uh, the uh, masterpiece, uh, Michael Kunio, Sakakura Junzo, and Yoshimura Jun, uh, Junzo. And next. And inside the Iron House, we have a lot of facility to welcome the uh, members and the guests. Library and the garden cafe, and the uh, beautiful lobby, of course, uh, accommodation, the hotel room, and the, uh, uh, I hope, three stars restaurant, Sakura. So we always welcome the uh, members and the all over the world. Uh, hopefully, uh, sooner or later, we will welcome uh, practically uh, the, uh, uh, so many guests to exchange uh, communication and the, uh, to, 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 to promote international you know, uh, communication. Okay. And next, please. And we have the very strong supporter uh, in the US side. Uh, 
uh, almost 30 years, over 30 years ago, this American Friends of Ein House uh, was set up in United States. Uh, this organization always support to the uh, Ein House Japan in terms of the uh, fund, in terms of the uh, membership and the PR also, and the, especially the right hand side, the bottom, the, the back, 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 back side of the uh, uh, Mr. Ken, uh, Rockefeller, this guy is the uh, David, today's moderator. Uh, David always uh, support to the uh, Iron House. Thank you, David. Thank you, David. Um, next, please. And this is the view from the uh, uh, banquet room from the Iron House in your winter times. So uh, we have the, uh, uh, actually the, uh, we will uh, welcome the uh, 70th year's anniversary next next year uh, with uh, uh, effort of the uh, new chairman, the uh, James Kondo -san. We have a uh, lots of lots of project to 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 continue to the uh, Iron House uh, sustainability uh, of the uh, as a place for the uh, uh, kind of the uh, philosophical leadership place. So uh, we always welcome the uh, so many people's donation and the uh, uh, also a membership also. So uh, this is a uh, conclusion of the, uh, this, uh, you know, presentation of the uh, I House and historically at the present and also. And the, I really appreciate for your uh, cooperation to hear my very exotic English. And the, I like to pass to the uh, David next, okay? Well, say thank you so much for that. And I hope everyone in the audience um, enjoyed taking a look at the I House for a few reasons. One, as a great historical example of the role that philanthropy played post World War II in bringing the US and Japan together, and the continuing legacy of that, uh, those gifts of philanthropy. But also, we thought this would be a very interesting time period to look at, perhaps in contrast to our own time. Uh, after World War II, it seemed to be a time when there was global space for uh, people to connect and a kind of global civil society developing. Uh, but perhaps now we're seeing uh, a kind of contrast to that when global civil society is perhaps shrinking. And so that's really the first question. And um, from this point on, we're gonna really have a moderated discussion. And I'd really like to turn to Katsuji uh, first and and ask you, Katsuji, what do you think about the current state of global civil society? Thank you, David, and uh, thank you, Kobayashi-san, for the beautiful and wonderful presentation. Before I answer your question, David, I'd just like to say two things. One is, um, um, uh, I didn't know you were going to talk about the ICU at the beginning. I'm also an al alumnus of ICU. So maybe, I don't know how big a part it is, but uh, I'm a child of the US-Japan uh, philanthropic effort. Uh, second thing is I'd really like to pay tribute to Irene, uh, who um, two years ago invited me, and along with the Tsuda-san, who's a Japan rep for the US-Japan Council, to the discussion about the US-Japan philanthropy and its future. And she really wanted to reestablish the, the good and the robust relationship between the two, uh, which now I recall, you know, after looking at uh, Kobayashi's presentation, uh, has a very, very uh, deep uh, and uh, history uh, to that. So uh, we like to, uh, we really have a collective mission to really uh, carry on the toast that uh, Irene. Uh, has left, left left with us. So those are the two things I'd like to like mention in the beginning. So in response to your question, David, yes, um, uh, before uh, coming back to Japan uh, for like five and a half years, I was working at a global civil society organization called Civicus. At Civicus, uh, uh, we started a program called Civil Society Watch in 2005, because increasing, increasingly at the time, we were very concerned about the, what we called a shrinking civic space, which was happening mostly in uh, developing countries and in emerging economies where um, uh, country leaders uh, uh, give preference to economic growth. And then, um, you know, uh, the, the, uh, the growth of democracy was really 
uh, put aside or like, uh, uh, you know, it was really uh, left as a, a secondary uh, thing to pursue. So we are very concerned. After 15 years, uh, Civicus uh, now has a, a program called Civicus Monitor, which is, I guess, more well known in, in the global civil society and international community space than 15 years ago, which actually is a bad news because that means that the, that the situation has actually worsened. And it's not just the you know, developing countries and the emerging economies we are talking about. We are talking about all the nations, which has a very uh, concern about uh, uh, suppression of the freedom of speech, uh, freedom of uh, association and the peaceful assembly. So that's de definitely a concerning trend uh, to say the least. Ooh. Amir, what are your thoughts on that same topic? I know you think about this quite a lot. Well, yes, you know, I'm actually teaching a class right now on philanthropy in times of crisis, and we're we're one of the assigned readings was the Civicus Monitor that that you know, shows the the the, uh, the the shrinkage of the space, and we see this in the realm of philanthropy. I mean, it was so wonderful to see you know young John and Shige in a period of institution building. Uh, right now, we have much more skepticism around the globe about philanthropy crossing borders. From you know, many countries are restricting that, including you know some of the developing countries because of fears of terrorism, for example. But everywhere from Hungary to India uh, to other countries, you can mention China as well. You know, uh, there's increasing skepticism among some of the very foundations that helped build the uh, you know international older order after um, the Second World War. We saw I House, the wonderful case. Um, it, it, it was, it's so inspiring. And I just want to also mention my, my own alma mater connections. I saw that among the friends of uh, iHouse was George Packard and the first instantiation. He was my dean when I was a student at Johns Hopkins Science. And then I saw that when you revive the, the friends of iHouse, Kent Calder I was a professor at Science. He, he was there when I was associate dean as well. But, but I think, you know, philanthropy is not seen as as, a, as, as an obviously welcome force for building institutions across borders as it, as it was in the period of the founding of, of iHouse. And we're seeing that in terms of the barricade, not the barricades is too strong a word, but the barriers that are being put up for philanthropy across borders in many, many countries. So I'm, I'm wondering about what are some channels through which people do connect inter internationally and uh, Amir, you and I had a conversation about SDGs. I, I wonder, is that a particular angle or, or channel through which people around the world can get together and build uh, sort of international philanthropy? I, I think so, in the sense that there is a sense that this was the SDGs were built, built through a lot of international consensus work and that they are there to kind of help um, uh, lift people out of poverty and solve issues that are of the commons in the planet, I think they are um, in some sense um, jointly arrived at and not, not politically uh, sensitive. Uh, I think the challenge for us is how to go about that and, and how, to, uh, you know, how do you uh, develop the means to, to address those, those, those issues. But certainly I think they're, they're a wonderful um, a consensus builder potentially uh, and certainly many philanthropists are looking to them as ways of, of, of crystallizing their purpose. Right. I, I've seen so many philanthropies. Uh, you just have to do a quick web search and you see SDGs mm -hmm. listed right front and center. Uh, and even at the Gates Grand Challenges event a few weeks ago, it was one of the first things mentioned. And Katsuji, you work uh, significantly on SDGs. Uh, it, what are your thoughts on the way in which SDGs can be used as a channel to connect during a time when it seems like global civil society is perhaps shrinking or fragmenting? Yeah, uh, actually there's a lot of things that we can uh, talk about when we, uh, when SDGs uh, are the topic of the discussion. But the now, because this session is about the philanthropy, I'd like to point out the fact that, uh, you know, the rise of the interest among the private sector, you know, the companies big and small, uh, that are very, very much interested in SDGs. I mean, unfortunately, US may not be um, 
a good example here, uh, but I think, you know, if you look at the globally, uh, uh, and the multinational companies definitely are very much interested in the SDGs. I was with Civicus when this discussion was happening in the formation of the SDGs between like 2011, 12, 13, and 14. I was struck by the, the growing interest among the private sector. And that comes from the realization in the international community that the philanthropy alone or public money alone cannot really uh, finance or to really solve all the global challenges that we face uh, that was crystallized in the SDGs. And then and the private sector also uh, said, yes, uh, we can be part of the solution. And that's how they kind of uh, uh, joined the, the force to try to really solve uh, global issues together. And so today we cannot really think of anything um, around the financing the SDGs without the invo involvement of the private sector, not just the philanthropy money, but the money they generate through other means such as investment. Yeah, that's that's great, and 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 that's a topic I'd like to move into in a moment. But before we do, I'd I'd like to give Kose. I, I know you at the beginning, Kose uh, expressed the caveat that you are you don't consider yourself a philanthropy expert, but you um, gave a powerful presentation, and so we consider you an expert. Um, <laughs> but I'd like to hear you know your thoughts, you know, on on this question of civil society today, because. Sure. The I House, you know, if our characterization is correct, formed at a time when there was opening space. Today, you know, if 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 we're in agreement here, it seems like there's significant challenges. But the I House still exists to build these ties. What's the, you know, what's your take on that issue of civil society? Hey, yes, uh, I think the uh, seventy years ago, the uh, space and place is very important at the time. It's still or now, it's very important, but. Right now, because of the uh, improvement of the technical tech, so we can consider about the cyber place uh, to, to, to set up the, uh, to communicate uh, over the world. So I think the next challenge, uh, especially the after COVID-19 <clears throat> pandemic, so the uh, cyber place, cyberspace or online space, online community is very, very important to, 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 to make mature of the communication. So next step is maybe the, the uh, to how it make a, a great up of the uh, cyberspace for the uh, civil community, and the but uh, we feel about feel like uh, you know face to face you know situation is a very important to mutual understanding, especially between the uh, country country and, and uh, person to person. So the uh, for the I house the next challenge is how, uh, you know, uh, uh, mixed of the uh, cyberspace and the uh, real space and the one plus one uh, becomes two more, three. So that is very important challenge for the, this is a comment for the uh, director of the White House. Okay. Yeah, thank you so much, Kose, that's, that's great. Uh, Katsuji, I wanna pick up on, on the topic that you raised um, and talk a little bit about transformations in the way that people give, the, the way in which people actually uh, enact uh, philanthropy. You, you mentioned that uh, corporations, you know, the private sector is getting more engaged and is essential, uh, you know, and, and uh, the, you know, the for-profit sector, um, private philanthropy, foundations, different ways of giving. Could, could you talk a little bit about some of the shifts taking place in the world of philanthropy, especially in Japan? Well, um, yes, I, I can also probably talk about the Japanese example, but, uh, you know, first of all, uh, as a global phenomenon, uh, one of the slogans that we hear these days, well, in, in, maybe in the last five years or so, uh, in the corporate space is uh, from uh, CSR to CSV, uh, from corporate social responsibility, uh, which, uh, you know, giving was included in that to creating social, uh, uh, creating shared value. So uh, the slogan, the new slogans these days among the corporate sector, uh, in the corporate sector is they are really the, the key player in the, the shared value creation. And what is meant by that is of course, you know, in the age of SDGs, they really need to contribute not just financially to the world, but also socially and environmentally. 
And that is happening uh, somewhat voluntarily within the leadership, the top, top management of the big corporations and small corporations. And at, same, at the same time is also happening uh, as, a, as a response to the external push, which is uh, primarily coming from the investment uh, community in, in, the, in the call for more ESG investing. Thank you very so, much. So, um, you know, like if you do a search of uh, impact and, uh, you know, giving impact and philanthropy spectrum, for example, you do, uh, you, you do see on the screen uh, several examples of how we visualize this. So one of which is uh, I, I was looking at it uh, in the Rockefeller Philanthropy Advisors uh, website. They say finance only, impact on, only. And then, so impact is a new term, but the impact only is really about the philanthropy. You know, they don't really expect any financial return. Uh, the finance only, of course, is the traditional investing, which is really, they really uh, um, look for financial return, maximum return, and no, no concern for social and environmental. And now we are talking about the impact, which is in this middle space. So the impact, there are the different products and vehicles uh, that will try to really focus on any of the, the gradation here to really have a ba balance between the financial return and impact return. And, and Katsuji, are, are there any particular shifts taking place in Japan that uh, you would want to highlight that might be a little different than things taking place globally? Or do you see Japanese... Uh, uh, philanthropy kind of following global trends? Well, again, um, you know, I wouldn't really want to um, just to single out philanthropy as such. I think the trend that is happening in the policy environment these days is, you know, because we, we, we have this uh, uh, call for, uh, you know, chiho sose, you know, regional revitalization because of the aging society, and uh, uh, depopulation of the rural areas. How are we going to be able to revitalize the regional economy is a big issue. So philanthropy needs to play a role, but at the same time, people do need to invest in local economies in, in search for financial return, but also uh, other kinds of return as well. So that is really maybe unique to Japan, but uh, um, you know, uh, in terms of the, the financial vehicles, I think, you know, we are uh, looking at the same type of patterns evolving in Japan as well. That's great. Th thank you for that. And, and Amir, um, similar question for you. You um, sit as the dean of uh, really the, the leading, only oldest <laughs> school of philanthropy uh, in the world, um, I believe. And I know you look at trends all the time. What, what are some shifts in uh, philanthropy that strike you as uh, fascinating, critical, and important for us to know about? Sure. Well, you know, we're, we're fascinated by philanthropy at our school, and we have an expansive understanding of the role of generosity in, in human lives and human society, which is much bigger than simply giving money. Um, but let me give you a couple of instances of a broader context that we follow. So... I had mentioned the closing of, of, of civic space. So we, do, we have two global studies that we do with partners around the world. One is called the Global Philanthropy Environment Index that looks at the ease of doing philanthropy in different countries. And that reflects what we've been talking about, the constricting of the space, the fact that it's becoming more difficult to send um, money across borders to form nonprofits and that there's more intrusion from the government. There's another study that we do that's called the Global Philanthropy Tracker, which tracks the flow of funds across borders. So uh, to Katsuji's point also, it also compares the flow of philanthropy uh, money compared to uh, private capital flows, official development assistance, and remittances. And when you look at all of those flows, the, the largest one by far is remittances. The remittances overshadow uh, official development assistance, which is followed by private capital flows, and then private philanthropy, which plays an important role, especially for the United States, because in the United States, private philanthropy is actually larger than official development assistance. So that gives you some sense of, of the magnitude. There's still, I think, I don't wanna give the sense that philanthropy is decreasing across borders. It's just become more difficult, but we're also becoming 
much more wealthy as a global community. So there are issues and especially development and health issues, especially when emergencies come along that people respond and respond very generously. In terms of trends, I think as we look at the emerging generation, um, technology is obviously one major trend and crowdfunding has become a, a big issue. Uh, so using technology to aggregate different kinds of small uh, giving for different uh, purposes, uh, I think that that's you know, something that's become um, uh, very prominent. Um, the emerging generation is also uh, kind of agnostic in terms of how they want to give back to society. It's not necessarily that they're going to volunteer for a formal nonprofit or give money to a formal nonprofit. Um, they're more, uh, and the kind of emerging generations are a little more skeptical of institutions. Um, if you have a movement where they can gather spontaneously, again, something that can be facilitated by technology that helps. Also their attitudes toward uh, workplaces, for example, you know, it's no longer the sense that, uh, you know, your job is separate from your civic engagement. Increasingly emerging generations expect that their, uh, that their work will also have impact to Katsuji's terms as well, that they will do something positive for the world beyond simply creating economic value. Um, and, and they also uh, expect their purchasing the decisions to reflect their, their social conscience as well. So we're seeing this kind of moving away, at least in the United States and some other Western countries away from formal institutions in the United States, you know, where you know, we have about 2% of GDP um, uh, is how much we give. Our giving last year was about $450 billion. That's a, about 2% of GDP. About 70% of that comes from individuals. You know, we think of the big foundations. That's less than 20% of giving. And corporations, I think in contrast to Japan, where they're very important for philanthropy, is only 5% of philanthropy in the United States. But the number of households in the United States that are giving according to measures that are classical in terms of giving to nonprofits, the number of, of, of households giving is going down and, and, and the reliance of funding is coming from a smaller number of very wealthy people at the very top. So there's a concentration of giving at the very, a very top of, of the uh, pyramid in, of, of income distribution at the same time as there's this kind of growing a social consciousness among young people that is not going into traditional institutional forms that it might have in previous generation. And then there's technology in there. So, so it's a time of great ferment. People are, I think, extremely philanthropic, but in, in, in innovative and different ways that is uh, exciting for those of us who have gray hair and to see how the world will be remade by the, by the emerging generation. That's re really interesting, Amir. Um, in a moment, I want to turn to you, Katsuji, and, and ask you about the very interesting point that Amir made that individual giving is significantly greater in the U.S. than corporate giving, and just characterize that in Japan for us. But before we turn to you, I, I wanted to ask you, Kosei, uh, about this generational issue of younger people in the context of the I House. You know, I think Amir made a good point that philanthropy is ex it's expansive. It's more than giving money. And I think a lot of young people that might want to engage with the I House probably want to do so out of a passion for its mission and trying to affect change and build international ties through the I House. But could you tell us a, very briefly, uh, are young people joining the I House? What's the relationship like with especially Japanese young people uh, in getting them engaged in an entity like that? Yeah, that is a very good question. Yeah, actually, yeah, we are now facing yeah, this challenge. Uh, uh, I have the, uh, supported by the uh, over 3,000 uh, uh, individual members, uh, but average age actually the, uh, close to 70 over right now. So we have to the, uh, uh, recruit new young members actually. So in order to, 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 to promote and invite, so uh, we have to make strength in the uh, peer, what is the IHAS doing right now? And what, what, what is going to do right now? And the, we have the uh, uh, invite very, very, you know, like uh, mm, very, you know, talented people as uh, members, uh, just uh, one by one. So uh, gathering for the uh, young uh, generation, the, um, you know, gathering, uh, we, we heard. But unfortunately, after the COVID, so it's already performed. So this is very important 
uh, to uh, you know uh, invite the uh, young people and to promote to to peer the what is uh, Ein House like this historical rule and the uh, uh, what goes on from now on. That's very important. And the, actually, the recently the uh, as far as you know, or donation itself, just uh, this couple of years, the uh, big donation is coming from not corporate actually, uh, from the individual. So these are the uh, members and the who had the uh, good experience here in Ike IHAS. So thanks to the good experience, good you know uh, uh, memory, so they uh, donate to IHAS directly. It's quite good, good, big money. So I think uh, that's kind of the uh, movement still uh, here and the uh, of the IHAS community and the. So still, uh, as I, again, and the young generation is uh, kind of the uh, very big challenge to invite and the, uh, how to promote. So I don't know the, uh, what is the right answer to, to mention, the, you know, to, to promote. But uh, one, one key is uh, like uh, not big money, like a crowdfunding type of, the, you know, uh, collecting money for the uh, young people. So I think the, uh, for the Ein House, uh, this is a uh, very, very big challenge, frankly speaking. So I would like to know the, uh, both your specialist comment, I mean, uh, opinion for the, how to, how, how to persuade the young generation for the uh, philanthropy and the uh, giving good, good, good view. Okay. Well, let, let me turn to Katsuji then with, with two questions, if I may. Uh, I think the first one, let, let's continue with this generational issue. And I'd be very interested, Katsuji, in your thoughts on how are young people engaging in uh, philanthropy, you know, in a broad way uh, or using an expansive definition of it uh, in Japan. Um, and then a second question, uh, my earlier uh, question, which relates to Amir's very interesting point, uh, could you just give us a, a kind of characterization of the structure of philanthropy in Japan? Or is most giving done by corporations in Japan? Is it individuals? Is it foundations? Uh, w what's that universe like? Right. Okay. So um, on the on your first point, uh, yes, and also maybe uh, Kobayasan. I think you know is. I, I spent, uh, what, uh, six weeks uh, as a fellow at the IHAS right after I came back uh, from South Africa in 2013. Great time, great ambience, you know, uh, wonderful space. Uh, so one of the things maybe you could do or like I was, IHAS could think about is to create a kind of space for, for uh, like social entrepreneurs and other entrepreneurs to come together you know, like a co-working space is something that we talk about these days a lot. And then that's where people do congregate. Well, I mean, they can't really congregate at this time, but, uh, you know, maybe in the near future. Uh, so um, that's really gives the vibration to the space. And also, you know, that may contribute to really uh, 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 lowering the, the, the average age of your member membership. Um, I think, you know, um, there are a few pockets when I look for where the best and brightest of Japanese uh, these days. There are a few pockets, I think. And one of them is actually in rural areas or like out of metropolis. Because people do not really want a lot of money. People do want to have a better quality life. That's better to, to raise their kids, that's better for their personal health and well-being. And that's where I, I did definitely see a pocket of best and brightest of the Japanese young people who really go to different communities and then work together with people in the community, try to, you know, like work on this Chiho Sose question, revitalize the community, revita revitalize the local economy work with uh, local credit institutions, local banks and others for financing. So there's a lot that are happening. Uh, and then, you know, they, they, are, they become the catalyst for, for those communities, work with the local government 
uh, which are really dying for new ideas and innovations. So that's definitely one place that is happening. And then of course the money needs to come after them, but uh, they have the ingenuity and uh, innovative ideas to make it happen. So um, that's how I kind of think about uh, and building on Amir's point about uh, emerging generation being more agnostic about uh, you know, which sector they work on. You know, they, you know, these people, you know, they, it, they don't really care whether, uh, you know, this is for the public good or private good, because the distinction becomes very blurred and these days. And I think, you know, you really need to think about the public good, you know, to make you happy privately. You know, they, you know, we can't really distinguish the two and the young people are the ones who realize that, you know, from their heart, not so much from the education, but, uh, you know, they see all the crisis and the climate and the, all the rise of inequality and all that. So, uh, and they do act with ingenuity and innova innovation. So that's really a promising trend that I see uh, among the, the younger generations. Um, and so uh, on your second point, you know, um, of course we don't have time to really give you the audience uh, the broad overview of the structure of the philanthropy and the giving in the Japanese environment. But I think these days um, I do see a kind of a still dissonance, so to speak, between what is happening today and um, uh, what is being practiced. In digital giving, uh, still small, uh, like the many US commenters do say that, and that may be true if you just look at the numbers. But we have this term kyojo, mutual help. You know, the slogan of the government these days is kojo, kyojo, and jijo, you know, like public help, mutual help, and self-help. And then, you know, in the space that I work in, we do uh, focus on the second one, which is kyojo, mutual help. So it's more like, you know, the, maybe not so much in terms of monetary giving, but people do help out with each other. And that's really the tradition of the Japanese culture and maybe more broadly Eastern culture. So it's not so much about, you know, the people who are well off to do something for uh, who are not so well off, but more, more of a, uh, you know, like a, uh, you are the neighbor, you are, we are in the same community, we do need to help out each other, that kind of thing. But, when I, what, but what I mean by dissonance is that uh, Japan is also experiencing the growth of inequality. So um, Westernized or like, you know, Americanized or whatever is happening is happening in Japan too. But uh, so we do need a different type of mindset and uh, way of doing uh, things uh, beyond the mutual help because there are definitely people who are much better off financially, economically and those who are very much suffering, especially in this COVID era. So, uh, so but uh, the, we haven't really been caught up uh, with the, the change of times to really go beyond or go beyond mutual help or do something including the mutual help, but to go beyond that. Mm -hmm. yeah, you... yeah, thank you. Um, Amir, it looks like you might have a response. I was just going to say that, yeah, that the, the, I think um, one of the reasons that uh, I think there's an undercounting of mutual help, a mutual aid around the world. I think that's that's kind of a natural way that communities help each other. And we've seen uh, in response to the COVID pandemic so much of that. And I did not know that the uh, Japanese government was encouraging that. But mutual aid societies um, are, are propping up all, all over the place. Um, so I think that's that's just something that that is uh, uh, universal and, and happens all of the time, and it reflects another trend that I think is important um, in responding to inequality that we're seeing among formal philanthropies, the, the organized philanthropies, that they're increasingly conscious of the fact that you know there's there's a lot of criticism of expert-driven um, giving that brings in experts and generates top-down kind of technocratic solutions. I think both as a response, and I see there's some questions in the chat about social justice and inequality, um, both in response to that and also in response to the fact that we just haven't had great success in terms of those kind of top-down interventions is that 
people are increasingly consulting communities to ask them what kind of programs they think would benefit them rather than leaving it to kind of bureaucrat bureaucrats and technocrats to make those decisions. And that in some ways reflects some of the ethos of the emerging generation as well, which is much more participatory, egalitarian, and skeptical of formal institutions. May, may I, David, uh, may I mention something about this uh, uh, element of social justice uh, and uh, its intersection with the giving, just uh, Amir just mentioned. Um, I was uh, part of, as uh, you know, I wear many different hats, but one of them is Japan and Peel Center. And uh, we have a collaboration with uh, a Hong Kong based uh, Asian wide uh, organization, uh, Center for Asia Philanthropy and Society. And they have been publishing Doing Good Index. And then, uh, you know, they kind of pointed out this uh, as a kind of a Asia phenomenon rather than just a Japan alone phenomenon. But uh, uh, it's in, in Asia, I think we do really try to have more collaborative approach to solving issues and between the public sector and, uh, and the civil society organizations. I think the US, uh, we have more confrontational approach sometimes, um, you know, and the justice, social justice uh, um, a narrative is often used to really, um, you know, work uh, to really confront or like work with the government uh, to, to say what's right. And then to really talk about uh, what needs to happen to, to attain social justice. Maybe we have to have a different con contextual understanding when it comes to Asia. Uh, at the same time though, I do really feel that uh, this element is missing in Japanese giving. We do give when people are in need. We do give when people need to have a uh, service delivery coming to them. But we have a hesitancy to give when people are really trying to change policy, to raise voice, to build a movement, to rally, to advocate. And then, and I think I like this uh, differentiation in English between the small p and politics with a small p and the capital P. I mean, we, do, we have to, I think Japan needs to really learn that too, because you know, to me, everything we do is political with a small p. And everything we do needs to have advocacy, social change, social justice building more, you know, like component to it. Uh, of course, th those who people who do service, who do provide service, like the Single Mothers Forum is a, is a organization that comes to my mind because they have been really working hard in the, in the, in the, in the pandemic to really help single mothers. And they not only do they help single mothers, they do reach out to government to really change the system, change the, the policy framework and regulations. And that's not comes to them very, very naturally. So the service delivery and advocacy needs to go hand in hand. And people need to realize that their giving can be used for both, but we still have a hesitancy to, to give for the second element. Mm. Thank you, Katsuji. Um, time always goes by too fast in these, and there's a number of really good questions from the audience. Some of them have already, in a way, been addressed uh, by you both, Amir and, and Katsuji, but let me kind of do a rapid fire uh, through some of these and, and try to combine them a little bit. And I'm going to turn to you first, Amir, uh, and I'll, I'll combine uh, perhaps three <laughs> questions in one. Um, there's, there's two questions that really are related to COVID-19. And they're asking, you know, how has this pandemic impacted the, the way that foundations are uh, both raising funds, you know, the way in which funds are, are collected and also uh, the way in which funding is being directed? Uh, are there any innovative, you know, tools or, or ideas? So how is COVID-19 impacting philanthropy? And I think it's fair to also... Um, you know, ask this question at the same time, how has the racial and social unrest in the US been impacting philanthropy? So let me turn to you first, Amir. Sure, we, we often say we have two, two, two viruses. One is the pandemic and the other one is the, the racial injustice virus that's become much more uh, um, visible. So um, in terms of response to COVID, I think there've been um, uh, kind of something that we see in terms of research that is done on, uh, on um, disasters and emergencies. 
And so typically during disasters and emergency, giving a response uh, quite, uh, uh, quite well. So we've done research on what happened after 9-11 and what happened after the Hurricane Katrina, giving goes up. Now, not every emergency is followed by a recession, but obviously in a recession, financial giving tends to go down. All of that research is actually based on, on what's happened since World War II. And, and really we could be seeing some major discontinuities because they're also kind of people with means who are not able to spend their money, they're staying home and their wealth is going up. So we're not exactly sure how that's gonna end up um, affecting giving at the end of this year in the United States where the vast majority happens um, uh, a vast majority of giving happens in the United States uh, between now and the end of the calendar year. Foundations have become very flexible in terms of allowing um, their grantees a lot more flexibility. They're giving them more unrestricted funding. They're also innovating. Um, Ford Foundation, Mellon, uh, Kellogg Foundation have actually borrowed in the markets, uh, issued bonds to be able to distribute more funds during COVID because interest rates are so low. Some of you who may be following the Ford Foundation know that Darren Walker, who has reoriented the whole foundation to social justice it, when he became president of what, six, seven, eight years ago, has even doubled down on that and made that even more important, investing in nonprofits that are led by black and, and brown people and, and using the financial markets as a way to leverage that. We have also been tracking the response to COVID. If you go on our website, we have a variety of studies including those of community foundations, which are an interesting animal um, that is spreading globally that are kind of locally based uh, aggregators of funds that also distribute them based on community needs. And we've surveyed and we found that over the United States, there were over a thousand of those that in the first few months raised over a billion dollars and distributed half of it as well. So there's been this kind of massive uh, resurgence and that is happening in a context of intense criticism of inequality and racial injustice and the role of philanthropy potentially in exacerbating that. So what Katsuji was talking about in terms of the small P and the large P, in the United States, there's been a lot of controversy in terms of you know, who, basically the question is who elected uh, some of these foundations that are playing a big role in creating policy institutes that have kind of political um, power and ability to, to, to switch our our, our policy discussions uh, in, in, in an, uh, in an um, oversized way because they have so much money um, to put into that as well. So I think, you know, huge response, uh, lots of innovation, a question about what's going to happen because uh, the nonprofit sector is still suffering. There's been about almost a million, do uh, a million uh, jobs lost in that sector, which is one of the largest employ employment sectors, bigger than manufacturing in the United States. So. So, uh, and, and social justice is an issue that is prominent among many foundations that tend, to, most foundations that tend to have a pretty progressive uh, bent to them. But if you're following American politics, you know that we are extremely, a highly polarized society and that, um, you know, issues of social justice are not universally uh, uh, seen in the same way. Well, Amir, th thank you for that rich uh, information. We, we clearly have to do three or four more webinars to dig into all aspects of this. Um, there's another question here, which um, maybe Kosei, I'm gonna turn to you for a moment uh, and I'll just read the question. As the new generation of givers, in this case, it's, it's talking about the US, but I think it applies to Japan too. As the new next generation of givers in the US will be giving increasingly less to nonprofit institutions, do you see over the next 20 years, a high level of these organizations no longer existing and a loss of a few national treasures? Or will there be a next generation of institutions that will be replenished? I guess, you know, when I read that question, I was thinking about uh, support to the I House and, you know, cool. I House is kind of a national treasure. Um, do you think there's a new generation of, of supporters? Yes, I believe so. The, so that's why yeah, I tried to do, you know, to, to, to do promoting the, for the, uh, uh, young generation, and the, yes, so oh, I think the yeah, uh, I'm not have the right answer, but uh, for the uh, I house uh, always the uh, uh, you know or, or try to challenge, try to challenge or to to P, good PR for the uh, in terms of the uh, to to promote to presentation uh, too much to the uh, young generation. 
So yes, and also I think the uh, uh, some of the young generation mentioned the, they didn't know the uh, such kind of uh, beautiful place. So I think the key point is uh, to write, you know, uh, PR itself for the uh, uh, house and the, to the uh, you know route for the invite uh, actually here. But uh, unfortunately, COVID nineteen it's a little bit difficult. But as I first mentioned, so I write to from you know uh, grade up for the uh, cyber I house for example. So maybe next week we have the uh, garden webinar. So uh, garden is a uh, very beautiful. So we like to promote so such kind of the you know uh, promotion to especially the young generation. So am I right answer there? Great answer. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we only have a, a few moments left. So here's uh, what I'd like to do before we wrap up. Uh, I'd like to give each of you a chance to make a final remark. And I'd like to, I'm going to wrap in a, a question here that uh, an attendee has written, um, which is a very practical question. And I'd like to ask each of you to maybe uh, give us a final remark on two levels. One level is maybe... Um, a kind of very hopeful grand level. And that is, you know, what would you say is something that philanthropy can contribute to the world today? Uh, what's your hope uh, for uh, future US-Japan dialogues on philanthropy? Uh, something along those lines. And on a practical level, if someone is applying to a foundation or a corporation and seeking funding, what advice do you have for them? <laughs> Amir, I'll turn to you first. Well, that's quite a combination, and I'll try to be short because I've <laughs> I've I've learned I've learned so much from uh, uh, this dialogue, and I think this kind of a dialogue is a is an expression of of human philanthropy at a basic level because we all come to this kind of a gathering with our minds open and with a, a, an attitude of generosity to try to learn and share, and I think that's one of the basic things that philanthropy creates for us across borders is this kind of curiosity and generosity to give each other the benefit of the doubt. Um, and 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 to want to to learn and build together. So I'm very hopeful about that. And I think the more we talk about philanthropy across borders, even if it's very critical and and criticizing the power of, of wealthy people using their philanthropy, I think it's 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 a it's a positive thing to do. It creates a space. It, it's one of the engines that creates the civic space in which we can have. Um, very generative discussions that lead to positive things across all other sectors. In terms of advice, in terms of applying to a foundation or a or a uh, uh, or any other uh, entity, is I think to to approach it with passion and persistence, and uh, you know make sure that you have a good uh, a good idea that you're passionate about it, and realize that it's not going to be a transaction that's going to be finished tomorrow which is something that most business people also know. You don't meet somebody and decide that you're gonna have a transaction finished tomorrow, but that you're building a relationship. And if you believe in what you're doing, persevere, your, your likelihood of success is very high. And thank you. Thank yep. that's, that's fabulous. Um, Kose, brief hey. response to those que two questions. Good. Yes, uh, back to the uh, Shige and the John. Uh, they are uh, the 20 and the 30, young generation at that time. So the, they set up the uh, I house. So at the time, it's World War II. Compared to the, uh, right now, it's a disaster of uh, that situation. So we can do that. So I think the uh, next generation, we're gonna be, have the uh, second eye house uh, set up is quite easy, I hope. So I think uh, we think always a positive uh, to the uh, other eye house director. So we are like to the uh, welcome the uh, next next ten, 10 decades to 20 decades uh, to keep this kind of the uh, you know philanthropical place. So I and we like to do the my best. So that is my message. Okay. Thank you so much, Kosei Katsuji. Okay, on the first one, uh, I would say social purpose organization. Every organization is a social purpose organization these days. So I think the world of philanthropy needs to really broaden their scope of uh, the world to really think about uh, other, uh, you know, vehicles for uh, financial transactions. And then, you know, on the recipient side, we are all SPOs. And then uh, it doesn't really matter whether you are for profit or non-profit. Everybody in the end 
needs to really uh, contribute to the contribute to the public good. That's a growing understanding. So there's a call for stakeholder capitalism, going beyond the shareholder capitalism after after the 50 year anniversary of the Milton Friedman's article in in New York Times. So that's one. The second one. Um, draw your theory of change. So you really need to show very clearly what is your vision, what is your strategy for reaching your goal and how you actually do it. Uh, we call it the theory of change or logic model or uh, there are other names to it. But uh, in the age of SDGs, we really need to show the future, the vision of the future in a back backcasting manner, uh, realizing you know, today we are living in a complex world and then things do change, your goal post may shift, but still, you know, we really need to, you know, look out for the future. 2030 is the goal, SDG uh, goal year, which is only 10 years from today, and we are running out of time. Thank you so much, Katsuji. We, it's 7.15 uh, Eastern time, uh, so our time is up, but I want to thank all three of you so much for your incredible insights. I learned so much uh, from this. And uh, I'd like to remind everyone of tomorrow's schedule, uh, day three of the US-Japan Council Virtual 2020 Public Symposium will focus on cultural and educational exchanges, which serve as the backbone to connecting people and communities across the Pacific. It'll be a good follow-on to today's conversation. At 3 p.m. Eastern time, there will be a panel discussion that takes a multi-sector look at developing bilateral partnerships and people-to-people -people relations by investing in local communities and exchanges. And then at 6 p.m. Eastern time, there will be a dialogue featuring a group of baseball legends and aficionados who will compare and contrast American and Japanese culture through the playing, management, and business of baseball and share their observations, stories, and anecdotes about the sports role in strengthening U.S.-Japan relations. And lastly, from 7.45 p.m. Eastern time, we will close out the symposium by looking to our young leaders for a message of hope and that's something we talked about today in the panel and a call to action around building strong and resilient communities. Three accomplished alumni of the USJC Emerging Leaders Program will share their inspiring stories of family legacies, personal growth and investing in the next generation of leaders. So please mark your calendars. I hope you can uh, join. And I really wanna also thank the audience for tuning in today. Uh, so with that, uh, we will close. Um, thank you all so much again for being with us. I learned so much and uh, I hope all of you did too. Thank you.